Welcome to Go Green Wilmette's webinar on the role of urban places in pollinator conservation, featuring Erica Hasley from the Field Museum of Natural History here in Chicago. Erica brings her background in both ecology and mapping to her work on urban monarch butterflies for the museum's Keller Science Action Center. The museum is documenting the role that cities play in providing habitat for monarchs and other pollinators. Erica began her career studying migratory pronghorn antelope in Western Wyoming. She has always been interested in how migratory populations of animals bring together many types of landowners and require a landscape level approach for conservation. After 10 years with the Keller Science Action Center, Erica has become convinced of the key role that social science plays in successful conservation. Our program tonight focuses on the story of urban areas like Chicago and how scientists have come to understand their value as places where beneficial insect populations could find habitat and rebound. Erica will also tell us about the Field Museum's exciting Monarch Community Science Project that supports this work. Erica? Hi, thanks for having me. So um, I should get my slides up here. Um, here we go. Oh, we practiced and I didn't hit share screen. All right, thank you for having me. We now have everything all set up. So that was a wonderful introduction and that's that's everything I'm going to say. So that pretty much takes care of the first two slides. Uh, so we are going to talk about how to support nature in Chicagoland. I'm going to talk a little bit about why a museum is telling you this. Uh, that That is confusing, particularly the Dinosaur and Mummy Museum that many people in the area have visited. We'll talk about why cities. Um, why cities are a place where we really talk about insect conservation and overall what we're doing for urban wildlife, hopefully ending with eight things that you can do, including our community science project. So I do work at the Field Museum, uh, seen here with our new and awesome race native gardens. Uh, we like to tout that this is our largest exhibit in terms of square footage focused on real living things um, and the, so the nature and the wildlife of the Chicagoland area. So we're very excited about that. Our marketing department likes to say that the Field Museum is fueling a journey of discovery to enable solutions for a brighter future, rich in nature and culture. And I'm really fortunate that it's the intersection of nature and culture where I do my work. Um, I don't think that, I think that our culture is the path to co conservation and nature and that our, Culture is filled with examples of taken from the natural world. I work in the Keller Science Action Center, which is like a department where we translate the museum's vast science and collection into action for conservation and quality of life. So we're really applied scientists. We're, um, we're taking things and putting them into the field. And again, it's the end of the sentence, the quality of life that deserves the emphasis because good conservation happens when it improves people's quality of life. And you can't have conservation if the people around it don't have a quality of life. So this work started uh, long before I came to the museum with like one and a half people uh, 25 years ago. And we work in two places in the earth, the Andes Amazon region of South America and here in Chicago. And over 25 years, our Andes Amazon colleagues have protected we're 26 million acres of land for conservation. And they've done that in collaboration with the indigenous communities and other people that live in and around that conservation land. Here in Chicago, we don't have 26 million acres to conserve, but we have over 10 million people in the greater Chicago land region. And it's engaging through those people that is our conservation work. It's the decisions made by the people that live in urban places that really determine their potential uh, or lack thereof as space for conservation. So it's been engaging with, uh, for me, it's been 11 years of engaging with people in the Chicagoland region and it's been awesome for all of it. So this is a small subset of the team uh, that focuses on conservation. I know my colleague Abigail has uh, given a presentation here before. Um, 
anybody's involved in Chicago land conservation, the birding world, you might know Doug Stotts. Um, and you see, we cover a wide range of expertise because that's important for the work that we do. Uh, as it said in my introduction, I was really originally trained uh, in doing mapping geospatial analysis, and I'm an ecologist, but I've spent years working with anthropologists, community engagement specialists, social scientists, artists, and I think those are all important tools in the toolbox that we bring to conservation. So with that, we know that cities need nature. We build our cities in beautiful places and we fill them with parks and representations of natural spaces. But it's more of an open question in conservation, does nature need cities? And so often they're portrayed as opposite ends of a spectrum. The city is always a empty parking lot or a disused shopping mall. And the nature is a beautiful place uh, with not a single human in the photo. And those are the two ends of the spectrum. And I hope if I do nothing else today, it's I convince you that those are not, that is not an accurate representation of the situation. Firstly, because there are a lot of cities in the United States. There are a lot of cities in the world and they take up a lot of land. And this gray stuff around outside of the city isn't all just remnant prairie and unspoiled natural lands. These are complex landscapes. They're complex for wildlife to navigate. They're complex for us as humans to understand. And so in the United States, we're about 85% urban. Um, a lot of, most Americans live in the city, whether they feel like they do or not. That's an increase from the 1950s, and that may be why we still have that identity um, as a rural nation out in the wilds of Wyoming, where I did my master's work. But for the most part, that's not where most of us live. And these are pre-COVID numbers, but the expectation is that by 2050, we would be 90% urban. Who knows if that will change. As a world, we are moving more and more urban. And there are over 300 urban areas in the United States with over 100,000 people. Not to mention significant urban areas with 50,000, 20,000 people. And these are, you know, they go all the way out to those areas that can feel rural, but are there still part of the urban envelope. So what happens broadly in cities is incredibly important. Not to mention they contain people who vote as we've all learned over and over in elections. So I wanna highlight this article uh, in the, this special paper section uh, because it, I'm gonna to return to it a few times. So this came out in either late 2020 or early 2021, because it all bleeds together now. This is a special section in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science focused on insect decline. And it contained this figure uh, that I've, I've simplified. Oh, I wanted to say this. Um, so these papers, uh, they, they mark a important moment in science where we talk about the decline of insects. For those of us who have driven a long distance, um, you can mark this with noticing something that in a long drive in the spring and summer, your car is no longer covered with bugs. And it's been covered with progressively less and less bugs over the years. So it's hard to notice the, the decrease because it doesn't happen in a year. It doesn't happen in a day. It's a slow decline over time. And these are hard to notice. And that's why, you know, even for science, th this is a big deal that these papers have come out and documented this decline because it wasn't like, you know, one day they all disappeared. And so the papers contain this figure that I've simplified a little bit, but to illustrate this death by a thousand cuts, how we've, we've, it's so rarely when we're losing a species or a group of species that one thing is the cause. Uh, you know, we can implicate the DDT and bird uh, predator declines, but rarely can we say one thing. And, and if we fix one thing, we'll just bring them all back. Species loss, particularly in insects, is many different small things stacked on top of each other. And one way to look at this figure would be to say like, oh, people are implicated in all of these things. It's humans, they're destroying the earth. Sure, um, that's one way we could look at. I don't think that that's a productive way for us to make change. It's also that we're the solution to these things, making changes to these things. Urbanization is listed as one of the causes. Well, let's discuss ways that we can do urbanization differently and create these space for species. So we'll come back to this a little. 
I use monarch butterfly. I study monarch butterflies. I've worked on monarch butterflies for a number of years now. I'm going to talk about them a lot as an example. I like migratory species. I did my master's work on migratory antelope in Wyoming. And I like migratory species as a way to talk about big conservation issues because they cover a big geographic area. And migratory species typically need different things in different parts of their life cycle or their migration. And so it really lets you talk about kind of a landscape level conservation. And that's what monarchs do for us. So if you know a lot about monarch butterflies, now would be a good time to check your social media, tune back in in a couple of minutes, because I'm going to give kind of the basic background on monarchs. The monarchs that you will see soon here in Chicago, uh, they'll arrive first week of June-ish, um, have overwintered in central Mexico, in Michoacan, state of Mexico, on the border, in uh, these mountain forests of Omayel trees. We'll have those monarchs uh, this summer, around late August, early September. There is the migratory generation is born. Those monarchs will fly all the way down to those overwintering grounds. They'll stay there all winter. And then in early March, they will begin their migration back. They will breed, lay eggs, and die. And then the next generation will continue the northward migration. So the monarchs that arrive here have never been here. It's a whole generation, multiple generation different. Uh, and then we'll have four to five depending, or three to four depending, short generations here in the Midwest, and it'll happen again. That's the Eastern population of monarchs conveniently located east of the Rockies. The other population, which I'll reference a little bit, is the Western population located west of the Rockies. Um, their overwintering grounds are mostly in California. They, they have a slightly more complex circular migration in the West. Um, if you've heard anything about monarchs where there's only 2000 of them left, that's the Western population. There's also a small population in South Florida that doesn't migrate that I'm not gonna talk about. Um, so as I said, monarch populations are in decline. Um, sometimes we say 80 to 85%. This graph is weird because it's in hectares because this is the Eastern population that goes down to Mexico. They congregate on trees and overwinter. So they measure around them and determine the number of hectares of butterflies. So six is highlighted in blue here because good science tells us that we need to average six hectares of overwintering butterflies, which is about 15 acres in um, American. Uh, we need to average those six hectares in order to keep the population stable. And you don't have to be a statistical analysis professional to see that we are not maintaining that. Um, it's been a significant decline the Western population, as I said, um, is even more significant to the point that we say they are quasi-extinct, functionally extinct. Uh, it's gonna take a significant effort to ever recover that population. So monarchs are in bad shape and that, that's something they share in common with a lot of insects. Um, monarchs are, um, you know, I, I, they're, a, they're a charismatic microfauna. Um, you know, maybe now is when I say the secret that um, this, all of the work that we do on monarchs is to some extent a pollinator bee project in disguise as a monarch butterfly, um, because literally no one has ever sent me a photo of their child happily covered in bees. Um, but many people send me photos of their children with butterflies on their shirts and in their hands, and uh, they're excited. And uh, the things that we talk about that you can do to protect monarchs are things that we can do to protect a lot of different pollinators, particularly the unsung pollinators of the ants, the brown beetles, the spiders, the flies. Nobody invites me to give a talk on fly conservation, um, maybe someday. But monarchs allow us to talk about a lot of these things. Uh, oh, good. There's a beautiful photo of monarch in the next slide. Uh, the last thing that you need to know about monarch butterflies uh, in order to kind of understand everything is that they do have these two state, I mean, they have multiple stages of their lives, but they have two important differences in their lives. So when they are uh, a caterpillar, so a female monarch will only lay monarch eggs on a milkweed plant, something in the Asclepius genus, and the caterpillars will only eat milkweed plants. So, and the adults, after the butter, after the caterpillar has been a hungry, hungry caterpillar, gone through its chrysalis and become a beautiful butterfly, then they drink nectar from flowers. 
So you could have a field of milkweed and not sustain the monarch population because you need other flowers for the adults. And you could have a beautiful field of, of flowers and not sustain the monarch because you do need to have milkweed for that caterpillar life stage. So it's nice from a conservation perspective in that it helps us create a diverse pollinator garden. And these, these ideas will come up. So I, I've told you what they need. I've told you that they're in deep decline. This is the wordiest slide I will show. Um, what's happening? I don't wanna leave anyone suspense about what's happening uh, throughout my talk. So in 2014, there was a petition made to the US Fish and Wildlife Service to list monarchs as an endangered species. The US Fish and Wildlife Service is the branch of our government that deals with endangered species. I wanna be clear, I, I'm, I don't work for the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, but they did some really good science to figure out these numbers. And I'll talk a little bit about where they came from that we need to maintain that 15 acres or six hectares of overwintering population to stabilize the Eastern monarch. And that would be about 225 million butterflies. Um, and the, to do that, we would need to add 1.8 billion, with a B, stems of milkweed to the landscape. Literature can vary between 1.3 and 1.8 billion, but it doesn't matter because it's billion with a B. It's a lot of milkweed that we need to add to the landscape. And they say that we'll need an all hands on deck strategy, which means it can't be just ag, it can't be just roadsides, it can't be just cities, it needs to be everyone to do it. Now, importantly, the deadline for that was 2020. That didn't happen, but a lot happened. So a lot of what I'm gonna talk about is work that has been done in those five years. Um, but we did reach the 2020 deadline. There, the Endangered Species Act is incredibly complicated and it has deadlines and petitions and rulings and things. And so they had to make a ruling in 2020. Uh, it came out in December of 2020, a time when none of us needed more bad news. Um, and it came out at the same time as numbers. Importantly, the number that the Western population had gone from an acceptable 30,000 butterflies to a nearly catastrophic, it was like 1,957 butterflies was all they could find um, in the West. So that's truly crisis. Um, and the Eastern population recorded one of its six, low, six lowest populations in the time that they have been recorded. So two really bad bits of news. And the Fish and Wildlife said, well, you know, our good, our modeling says that listing them as an endangered species is warranted. The science says we should do it, but it's precluded by other higher priority species. And the other species are high priority. There's a lot of need for endangered species. And so that's where we sit right now. The issue might be revisited in 2024. It might be revisited sooner, depending on legal challenges. Um, but that's kind of the legal status of monarch butterflies, which is important because it impacts the kind of work that's been happening. So I wanna highlight 1.8 billion with a B. Um, why do we need to add 1.8 billion stems of the milkweed to the landscape? And where did they go? Like, did we, we used to have them and, and what happened to them? Um, so the population started declining in the 90s uh, that we knew. And those milkweed were probably in the agricultural landscape. No one was really paying attention to milkweed except that it was a huge problem. Um, farmers didn't want it. Uh, milkweed is officially listed as a noxious weed in like, I don't know, a lot of Midwestern states. I think still in Illinois, definitely in Iowa. Um, my understanding is that it's like real bad for cows and horses to eat when they're grazing. And so there's a push to remove it from pastures. Uh, you can imagine if you've ever broken one and gotten that sticky sap on your hands, that if you're, you know, trying to harvest your crops and you hit a patch with your combine, and gum up your combine, and now you can't get the harvest in that day, that's a real problem. And Midwestern farmers don't really need more problems. And I say all of this to say, we're not likely to add milkweed back to production row crops. Um, so where are we gonna get it? What, what is the fish and wildlife thinking when they say all hands on deck? So that comes from this paper uh, by Wayne Dogmartin and a bunch of, a bunch of his colleagues. Uh, I, people may know Iris Caldwell at UIC. Um, these are serious scientists who did work to come up with these numbers. And what was striking to me is, uh, you know, this, so this is like 2015, 2016, I can't remember the year on the paper when this is happening. And 
the serious science is saying, well, cities are contributing nothing to milkweed populations. And in our predictions, they're not likely to contribute a lot more. We're gonna do better than corn and soy. They're saying corn and soy, they're not doing anything and they're not likely to do anything more. But we're not really seen as able to do a lot. And those of us who lived in cities firstly knew, well, I mean, I've seen milkweed here. There is some of it. Um, you know, can it be good habitat? Can we reasonably add more milkweed to the landscape? That was the question we asked ourselves. And so we looked into it. And the first thing is you could understand them saying that cities contribute nothing to the landscape because the, the data that we have was sort of from a mapping remote sensing standpoint to characterize cities for a long time has looked like this. You know, here's the field museum. This is the South Loop. Uh, it pretty much looks like some sort of zombie hot zone, toxic landscape. Certainly not somewhere you'd wanna go. Certainly not somewhere you'd think could have habitat, all of that red urbanization. Let me switch this to some high quality data. This is what we can do now with um, like lasers from airplanes, it's called LIDAR. Um, this allows us to look with less than one foot resolution into what's happening. And we've made trees dark green, grass light green, buildings red, roads black, water blue, kind of things you would expect. And suddenly this starts to look like, well, you know, maybe there could be some habitat here. Boy, like that whole Northerly Island thing, which previously just looked like landscape. And I, this is, I know it says 2011, this also exists for 2016, but um, this starts to look like a place that there could be habitat. What is that potential for cities? So we went out and looked, we spent several years looking we spent several years picking random blocks in the greater seven county Chicago region, uh, randomly picking blocks, sending our poor interns out to drive them in from the public way to write down what was there, what was in people's yards, what flowers were there, what was blooming, were there gardens, was there milkweed? Um, what did those look like? And we did it for all different kinds of land, not just people's yards. And we made a graph make many graphs uh, to look at what is that potential? So what is the potential to add milkweed to the landscape in urban places? And so you see the sort of categories of urban habitat. We had to come up with categories. This is sometimes called land use. So open space conservation, that's like a forest preserve. Uh, open space, that is a conservation mission. Open space non-conservation uh, is open space that maybe has a recreational mission like a cemetery. I mean, no, sorry, <laughs> like a park district, but we didn't call it recreational because cemeteries are also in here, which don't have a recreational message. Um, but these places, these folks are doing a lot uh, for, they're adding milkweed to the landscape. They're doing a lot of conservation work. Vacant lots are this big question mark uh, for a lot of people because sometimes they're vacant for a long time. Sometimes they're vacant for a short time. I'm very interested in this, um, but not working on it right now. Roads, rights of way, you don't think about how much all the roadsides are until you add them all up. It's a huge amount of land. Same with the land under the power lines. I think ComEd is still one of the largest landowners in the state just because they own that land under the transmission lines. Um, and there's a lot of work being done on that, particularly at EYC, a person named Iris Caldwell uh, is really working on that. But the big bar, well, so I should say, the biggest bar is the one I can't put on here because it blows the whole graph out of proportion. That's ag land. There's a lot of ag land, even in the seven county area. But as I said, we're not focusing on that right now. And people are working on that. So you have this huge potential of residential land, the land in people's yards that they control, they get to decide what happens there. Turf grass is still the largest irrigated crop in the US, like more than corn and beans combined. Turf grass is the largest irrigated crop, and there's a lot of fertilizer that goes into turf grass. There's a lot of inputs into turf grass. So there's potential there. Um, but there's a difference where if we want to make a change to five acres of something in a forest preserve, we definitely have to ask some people, work with the forest preserve, but it's just one entity that we're dealing with. And we can be reasonably certain, certain that in 10 years, it'll still be the same. If we want to make a change to five acres of residential land, we got to talk to a lot of people and we have to keep talking to them every year to keep them continuing with that change rather than the reverting back to what our system is kind of built around, which is um, 
uh, turf grass. So we published some papers about this. There is an, a special section in Frontiers, uh, like the one that's currently in uh, Proceedings, where we published these papers. We were happy to see them get some press. But we got some questions from our colleagues in monarch science and monarch conservation. And they said, sure, OK, great. Cities have all this milkweed potential. But how do you know that it's as good as milkweed patches in roadsides or in rural areas or in a grassland? And how do you know when somebody says, you know, how, how do you know how to tell people how to plant a milkweed patch? We would get this question from, I still get this question from people. Okay, I'll plant milkweed. What should I do? What should it look like? Well, we didn't really know because we had been counting milkweed. We'd been characterizing where it was, but we didn't, we didn't know what an ideal patch would look like. So we went back um, and we looked at our data. And the first thing is there's this big purple this is everything that we couldn't see because we didn't have permission to look in people's backyards. We were driving or walking the public way and characterizing what we could see. We couldn't go and ask all of these people. We did something like 150 of these blocks. And we've taken forever just to ask people. We'd still be asking. So at first we tried paying interns to actually go out and look in people's backyards with their permission. And what we learned is, cause you have to look every week to watch the monarchs go through their life cycle that those people pretty much just drove their entire internship and we couldn't really get that much data in that because we really just had June to late August to collect. So it was really difficult. And then we hit up on this genius idea that we were not the first people to think of. Why don't we just ask the people that live there? We, are, we wanna engage with the people who've made this change and added milkweed to their landscape because we want them to continue making that change every year and letting the milkweed continue to be there. So, and we don't wanna drive. Um, so how can we do this? We just ask the people who live there. And this turned out to be a great decision because we piloted it in 2019. And then in 2020, this was suddenly the only field work that we could do because we weren't allowed to leave our homes. Uh, and it was good that we'd had 2019 to practice. So this became our COVID project. And I wanna return to our death by a thousand cuts to talk about so to talk about one paper that was in that special section. It's the eight actions for individuals to save insects. And I've put the monarch in the center of the eight actions because that's what we're talking about. But these are really to save all kinds of insects. And I keep forgetting that my circle shrank and some of the words got split funny. But I'll say that maybe they needed eight to make the paper longer because I feel like you could condense some of these. But the top is to convert lawns, doesn't have to be your whole lawn, to habitat for insects. Growing plants that are native to your region. I you guys are gonna have a whole talk just on that. So it's good I didn't expand. Um, reducing pesticide and herbicide use. Don't think about it, but limiting the exterior lighting because the little moths that flutter around there can literally just flutter around until they die. Um, they're really, those lights are hard for them. Lessening runoffs. I mean, here soap is a thing. I, I don't know. I, I don't wash my car, but um, but salt is, is a big thing here and in the Midwest with our salt use. Advocating and educating people about insects. Um, you know, we're doing that right now. Reducing that negative image. Uh, it's is apparent. It strikes me that so often the villains of my children's books are bees. Um, and it, it's surprising, you know, poor Winnie the Pooh is like constantly getting chased by some bees. And I mean, he's like a bipedal bear stealing their honey. I don't know if I can really hold it against them. Um, and, and then of course that leads to creating lo local action. And so I, I like to think that, and I'll talk a little bit about what our community science project is and what we ask people to do, but I'll share for me, um, you know, when we made this project, uh, we had a little box for when you submit the data that you could have a note. And we didn't really know what we, what people would put there, but we wanted a way to have people communicate with us. And uh, we got all these stories. And getting floods of stories every week of people having an amazing experience with nature in the middle of our COVID summer was frankly uh, touching and amazing. Um, and as I said, uh, you know, now that I talk about butterflies and not bees, um, you know, I get pictures of people's children excited to be around the insect that I'm studying. Um, and, that, and that's really where it's at. You know, it's 
this is a, we're not going to fix this in one summer. We're not going to fix it in one year. It took decades to get us in the position we're in. It's going to take decades to get us out. So this is a generational problem. And so seeing that we've created a project that lets people share this with their kids, kids are great at it. They're close to the ground. So they're good at looking for the eggs. They don't have any back problems. Um, those of us that created the project, we all have small children. So we were like, how can we do work and parenting? Because it's COVID. Let's combine these. Um, oh, that's interesting. I uh, don't know why those moved down there. So anyway, it's community science. So we're asking people to monitor, typically at home, the, a, a patch of milkweed that they can get to every week. So we would say your, your home, your work, your place of worship. And then in 2020, we're like, just stay home, I guess. Um, but as we can all move more out in the world, it's a, it's a patch of milkweed that's easy for you to monitor every week. We think this is a powerful way to engage people um, because, because we've done it. When you suddenly are looking at the same patch of plants every week, you notice all kinds of different things you wouldn't see before. When you're doing that weekly monitoring, you go, you know, I have a week in June where nothing's blooming. And I, I, didn't, I didn't think that. Um, this is something that like as scientists, we often get to have this experience of focusing on one thing for a long period of time. Um, sometimes the exclusion of all other things. And it's really nice to be able to, to share that. And I encourage people to do it. Um, so you're monitoring the caterpillars as they move through their stages. That's the uh, slides that are or the words that are hanging off the slide. Um, and so you're really getting to see them grow and change over time. And frankly, to disappear because most monarch eggs don't become monarch adults. A female monarch will lay about 200 eggs and less than 10% of those will survive to adulthood, which is sad, but they're also food for other things. Um, if anybody knows Doug's Ptolemy's work uh, on, on conservation, he says 90, I think it's 93% of songbirds feed their young caterpillars. Not usually monarch caterpillars because they get some toxicity from the milkweed, but caterpillars are hugely important food for birds. And so, Essentially, you're growing bird food in your garden and you don't have to fill that thing with seeds. Um, and it turned out it was a very COVID compatible project, which is not what we were planning, but it worked out really well for us. So this is two years uh, of participants, red from uh, 2019, yellow from 2020. You can see we grew. Um, we had 2020 as our, our 2019 is our practice year. We got a lot of great feedback from people who participated in the project and we think we made it better um, in 2020. And no one could travel um, and you know really we're pleased to have people engage with the project um, we're excited about the span to 10 counties because that's further you know when we were sending some poor intern out to drive and do this we could never have covered this area and we certainly couldn't have counted 6,000 eggs uh, this is a little focus in on just uh, closer to the Chicago area some of the, the partners that helped us out in the first year and then the growth in the second year You'll see we lost the uh, lakefront sites at the museum because the museum campus was closed and we couldn't go there and monitor. Um, and this is some of the things that we get. So we get these photos from people. Um, and in part, I'm, I'm hoping that this is convincing that uh, really any patch of milkweed can participate. So when we were using satellite and airplane flown data to find habitat, you know, certainly none of this top row would have counted as potential habitat in that. Uh, we, we couldn't look at people's balconies and see, you know, we get data from potted plants. Uh, and six years ago when I started this, um, the conventional wisdom was that you couldn't grow milkweed in a pot. Uh, it's a deep taproot plant, like a lot of native plants. And people were like, it's not gonna grow in a pot. It does, uh, and we get data. Um, we knew that community gardens could be important, but we, at six years ago, weren't engaged with community gardens. We certainly weren't getting data from them. And now we have people saying, you know, yeah, I plant milkweed around my community garden, plant other native plants to get more pollinators, to get better production for my garden. Um, this little uh, strip between a fence and a sidewalk, that's not gonna be picked up on some kind of satellite data. Those aren't even, people are squeezing habitat into things that were never potential for us um, in our previous work. And so, this is the little quickie. So this is only two years of data, totally not publishable. Um, we compared places that never got eggs or caterpillars because we do get that. And we, 
We very much appreciate when people continue to weekly send us data where there were no eggs or caterpillars, because understanding the difference between those is really important. So they tended to be smaller. And I wanna say we have sites that have one milkweed plant and that killer makes it through all of its life stages. So it's not impossible, it's just more likely, it seems from early data that having more plants tend to be in the more successful patches. It doesn't seem to really matter if you have one or multiple species of milkweed. They're about equal. Um, when data is this small and messy, these numbers are essentially equal. The patches that are more successful do tend to have more species blooming. So this is when somebody goes to monitor, they count the different species uh, of plants that are blooming. This is optional. Not everyone does it. You don't have to be a botanist to do our project and know all the different plants in your yard. Um, if people want to do this, they give us this data. Um, and I think that there are probably more species blooming because this is probably the key thing and other literature supports this. That the first year that you plant milkweed, it doesn't seem to be as successful. Um, I, I would guess, I don't know. Uh, my guess is the female monarchs, when they lay eggs through their feet, they can taste how toxic the, the plant is. Uh, and they are selecting for the more toxic milkweeds. And I'm wondering if plants in their first year, they're still getting established. They're not putting their energy as a plant into producing those toxins. Um, so that's my guess. And, and I do think that's hard because some people plant milkweed and they're like, I didn't see anything. And then they don't keep it around for the next year. Size might be important that they, we have really tried to zero in on what a good size, what, what a good minimum size is because people ask us. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're seeing maybe that can matter. Uh, but obviously, you know, if it's a bigger garden, they're just gonna see more eggs because there's more plants. So again, not publishable science data. And then the density, how close the plants are together doesn't seem to matter. There's a lot of data that it matters at a big site like Medewin, but I think these sites are small enough that it's probably not important. So, you know, with that, I, I kind of want to um, leave it at, at, this is also a project of creating those ambassadors. Uh, we're asking people to plant, uh, and, and I'm glad you guys are having a, a native uh, landscaping uh, port talk because that's a not my area of expertise. Um, but you know, milkweed is uh, sometimes an acquired taste. So you see someone here with common milkweed, um, and that can be a that's the one we see down the center of the highway. Um, it can be a distinctive plant to plant in your yard. Uh, there are other species that maybe fit more in with a garden. But we're asking people to, to do something a little different and kind of become that ambassador and convince other people. Um, and then you see my kid with, those are not monarch caterpillars, those are swallowtail caterpillars, but um, you know, to convince both our neighbors and that next generation that you know, caterpillars aren't gross and ugly, they can be kind of cool and cute. So you join us by typing this slightly weird URL um, in to uh, our site and you can kind of, there's a like sign up that gets you on the email list. We will have, we have a Zoom training now that we learned this through COVID that we can do a talk. It, it asks you for two hours. It's really about 90 minutes um, where we kind of tell you how to do everything. And then in late June, if you don't have milkweed or you just want more, we'll have plant giveaways um, at various places throughout the greater Chicago area where you can go pick up a few milkweed as our appreciation for doing the project. And at those sites, we'll have monarch eggs and caterpillars provided that there are monarch eggs and caterpillars to see. So you can kind of see one in real life because me explaining it on Zoom sometimes isn't as helpful as seeing one in real life. Folks can start monitoring as early as the first week of June. And we, we love it if you already have milkweed, if you can jump in and start monitoring in June. But if you can't get a plant until our giveaways, um, it sounds like you can buy one from your native plant sale maybe. Uh, and I highly recommend that um, because ours are grown by students. Um, to uh, Ju July is the big month. So those four weeks in July are kind of our big month to get data. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna stop talking and stop sharing my screen. 
it's always fun when somebody stops talking and then squints for a while. And I have to unmute. Uh, <laughs> we all just fumble around. <laughs> That's right. um, thanks so much. This is such an exciting uh, area and such an exciting project. Um, <clears throat> and so we're going to have uh, now Kate Amoruso from the village of Wilmette, who's going to talk a little bit about the effort here uh, by the village to add some of this pollinator habitat in places that, that we can, um, uh, uh, as a public entity, as a village. Um, and then we will open this up to uh, uh, questions and answers. And um, we will, I'm sure, have a, a lot of really interesting things to talk about. OK, so Kate, would you yeah. like? Yeah. All right, I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you again for having me. Um, I like it, like you said, I'm I'm going to be talking about some of our um, pollinator habitat restoration efforts in the village of Wilmette. And Erica really introduced my uh, my presentation pretty great because um, it, you know my theme as we go along here is just um, trying to find these little pockets of open space in a town like Wilmette that is essentially a 100% built up community. Um, so yeah, you're definitely going to see a theme throughout my presentation of um, you know us just trying to find little pockets where we can stick some pollinator habitat. And uh, the first such pocket, if I can advance my screen here, of course it's not working. There we go. Um, the first such pocket is going to be our Elmwood Dunes Preserve. Um, this was uh, a site that's located between two uh, lakefront residential properties at the end of Elmwood Avenue. Um, the restoration you can see here began in 2013, and it was just full of invasive plants, uh, but we were able to clear the site enough to get it seeded in 2014. And then the middle picture there is from the first, uh, the first summer after it was seeded. And as you can see, it, nothing's, not a whole lot's going on there. Um, it, it's a lot of cover crop. There's some black-eyed Susans in there. And as Erica mentioned, that they're really working on um, putting down roots that first, uh, that first summer. Um, and then by the third summer, it just exploded with color. Um, and that's the, the third picture, or the, yeah, the third picture there. Um, and uh, you can kind of see some of the, the plants there. The most common species we have are the bergamot, uh, the two, the yellow and the purple coneflower, and various sedges. And uh, this is a photo that I actually took in 2019 of the site. Um, and you can see, you know, the bergamot, you can see the two different types of coneflower. And um, if you look way far in the back, you will see the milkweed. And I was able to actually catch a monarch visiting the site too. Um, and the next site that we decided to focus on um, was our, our cul-de-sacs. We have a bunch of cul-de-sacs in town um, that are just this unproductive turf grass. Um, and granted, most of them do have trees in there, but we, we decided we, we can work around the trees um, and get something a little bit more productive into those spaces. Um, so this photo, um, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back for a second there. Um, this photo was obviously taken before we did any restoration work there. And we had an opportunity here because we were resurfacing the street. Um, so we took that opportunity to install what ended up being a pollinator garden, we, we were hoping to actually make it a rain garden, but the grading of the street just didn't cooperate with us. So it ended up just being a pollinator garden um, that we installed in 2017. And uh, we were able to plant things like milkweed, uh, golden alexanders, coneflowers, liatris, foxglove, um, as well as some native grasses. And uh, this first photo is, is when we were first installed it. And this is a little bit later in the summer when everything was starting to bloom. 
And now I'm going to jump ahead in my timeline a little bit because working off of our the success of Hill Lane, um, we had an opportunity with our in conjunction with our neighborhood stormwater storage project this past year in 2020 um, to do uh, you know our first um, real big push for some legitimate rain gardens um, at um, you know on public spaces. Um, so that was at the corners of Laverne and Washington. Um, we have nearly identical rain gardens like this at all four corners now. Um, and the rainwater from the street is funneled directly into these low-lying areas um, that are planted with coneflower, um, allium, some native grasses. And then in the middle here, you can kind of see a little bit of, of orange blooming there. Um, that is butterfly weed, which is a type of milkweed. Um, it's just a little shorter than the ones that Erica was showing on her presentation. So it's a little bit more compatible with the um, with a corner type of landscape. Um, so all, all of these are planted um, sim with a similar plant palette and they have the, um, the rocks in the, um, the entrance there to slow down the water a little bit so that the plants don't get washed out. And then they all have these um, raised storm sewers as well in, in case of a very heavy rain, um, uh, you know, it won't overflow the curb, it'll actually go down into the storm sewer there. And this was a pilot project that we really hope to expand into other areas of town over the next several years. And we were also able to get um, some buy-in from a few residents um, who wanted to convert their traditional turf parkways into um, you know, a more productive uh, pollinator friendly habitat. And th these are two examples of that um, on Laverne. And now going back to my original timeline here, we're jumping back to uh, 20, 2018. Um, we started looking at our municipal facilities and seeing what we could do there. Um, so this was our police station um, prior to 2018. Pretty barren, lots of turf grass, same old story. Um, so we decided to expand the existing um, uh, planting beds that were already there. Um, and we installed um, some wild geranium, coneflower, allium, um, some New Jersey tea, uh, little blue stem, coreopsis, liatris. Um, no milkweed at this location, uh, just because it is a little bit of a shadier location. Um, but uh, we, we also did a similar installation at the, uh, the water plant in 2020. Unfortunately, that didn't yield a whole lot of great photos just because of the timing of the installation, um, but that will also be featured on our web, Wilmot website um, once everything starts blooming this year. Um, and again, in 2020, we did a huge installation at our village hall um, thanks to a very generous grant from the Wilmet, uh, from the Rotary Club of Wilmet Harbor. Um, this site was previously planted with about $2,000 worth of annuals every single year. Um, and annual plants don't really do anything for the most part to support pollinators. And they also require a lot of supplemental watering. Um, so we started working with the Rotary Club and we came up with a plan to reduce those annuals um, and replace them with perennials and also revamp a lot of the outdated landscaping at our village hall. So I have some before and after photos and just keep in mind that these were taken right after installations. So um, they will definitely fill in the space a little bit better within the next year or two. Um, but this is the very front of the village hall. So we've got some sedum, some coneflower, um, liatris, um, and then you can't really see it because they're so tiny. Um, but we do have some foxglove beard tongue and some coreopsis planted there. This is again another, um, another area at the very front of village hall planted with the same plant palette, trying to keep it pretty uniform. Um, this is the memorial wall at Village Hall. We expanded the, um, uh, the planting bed there to get a little bit more room for some things. And then um, we did a, a big expansion of the planting beds on the uh, Wilmette side of the Village Hall property uh, to get a lot more room to, um, to get some more plants in there. And then also um, uh, to give 
more seasons of interest, four seasons of interest is always what we're going for there. And looking forward, this is probably the most exciting project that we have um, you know, on the horizon in Wilmette, and it's definitely the biggest one we've ever um, taken on. And it, that's the what we're calling the Wilmette Eden Pollinator Corridor. And that's taking these um, big swaths of vacant land um, adjacent to the highway, adjacent to the Edens, um, and turning that underutilized land into pollinator habitat. Um, and thanks to another generous grant from the Rotary Club, um, we were actually able to install the first of these sites um, at Lake and Laramie in 2019. So that's this site right here. Um, the before picture is on the left. Again, it's just um, turf grass and weeds for the most part. Um, some good healthy trees, luckily, but um, other than that, not, not too much going on there. Um, and the photo on the right is actually immediately after we had seeded the site. Uh, we seeded it as a dormant seeding, which basically means we install the seeds in the wintertime, they overwinter, and then they eventually, um, they bloom in, in the spring when the weather warms up again. Um, now, similar to the Elmwood Dunes property, um, we installed this in late 2019, and then they spent all 2020 um, building roots. So. If you drove by the site at all in 2020, you probably saw a lot of cover crop and maybe a few black eyed Susans, but that was pretty much it. Um, so that's why I have this slide. Um, this is representative of the seed mix that we used at this site. So um, we might, we're hoping to start seeing some of these um, species this year, um, but certainly in that third year is when we're really expecting to see all of them pop. Um, so right in the middle there is that orange butterfly weed, um, which is a type of milkweed. Um, we, especially with this site, just because of public safety concerns, uh, we really tried to keep the plantings low to the ground, so under three feet, um, which is why we don't have that traditional milkweed um, that you, you know, the side of the highway type of milkweed. Um, but the butterfly weed is, is just as supportive of the, the monarchs. Um, and then we have all of the other flowering natives um, surrounding that to then support the butterflies after they um, are done with the milkweed. And then looking way ahead, actually, I'm sorry, looking, looking ahead to this year, um, this is a, the, a really exciting project at Glenview and Hibbard um, that is actually about to break ground. Um, this is a naturally low-lying area. Um, it's a parcel of land that um, we believe is owned by the county, um, kind of set aside for some possibly future road work if, if they were to expand Glenview, Glenview Road. Um, but it, it's a naturally low-lying area. It floods during rains, um, and it doesn't really drain very well because it's all turf grass and weeds. Um, so we decided to take this area and again, in conjunction with the neighborhood storage project, we were able to um, plan a, for a bioretention cell, which essentially means um, this is the plan for it. We're going to, if you can see this, this big rectangle here, we are going to dig out the center of the site, essentially fill it with gravel. Um, so that it can, uh, you know, help infiltrate some of that storm water that's coming from um, the road and the sidewalk. And then we're going to backfill it and then fill it all with, um, you know, native and pollinator friendly plants. Um, that center area is going to be all switchgrass. And then the um, A, B, and C gardens on the side, um, like I said, they're going to have things like coreopsis, milkweed, liatris, coneflower, ironweed, and aster um, supporting all, all types of different pollinators. And then looking way, way into the future um, is this is the next, you know, corridor site that we really want to tackle at the corner of Glenview and Long. Um, we actually applied for an open lands grant uh, for the design of the site this year. Um, so we'll hopefully hear about that in July. And this would actually be a joint effort with the village of Glenview because it's a shared property between our municipalities. 
So we're pretty excited about that prospect. Um, and we'd be looking to do something similar to the Lake and Laramie site. Um, just a big, uh, you know, low-lying meadow prairie um, with a bunch of pollinator supporting plants. And that is all I have. So I think we're gonna start taking questions now. Wonderful. Oh, thank you so much, Kate. Um, <clears throat> and so actually what strikes me here is that uh, maybe if, if people are interested in the, the uh, Monarch Community Science Project, but they don't have milkweeds in their own yard, we might be able to fix them up with some village properties. It's sort Absolutely. Of yeah, um, fantastic. Well, um, so Kay, could you clarify for me one thing before we start? Um, so ordinances in Wilmette do not pre prevent um, residents from planting uh, in the parkway um, plants. Yeah. We, so we do have some, we have a policy. I don't think it's actual ordinance, but we do have a policy for planting in the village right of way. Um, Right of ways are tough um, just because we do have utilities in the right of way. So, um, you know, we, we just want residents to understand that, um, you know, if you're planting something directly over a water main and we have a water main break, um, you know, it is possible that that would need to be ripped up. Unfortunately, it just um, kind of is the nature of the beast. Um, and also for, I mean, I'm sure all the Wilmette residents know this, but we have a lot of parkway trees on our, on our parkways. And um, you really don't, just for the benefit of that parkway tree, you really don't wanna be planting anything um, too close to the trunk of that tree and, and really nothing ideally within the drip line of that tree, um, which is the whole canopy. So that actually limits um, a lot of the parkways uh, in town um, for, for doing new sort of excavations and new installations. Yeah, very good point. Right. You want to do it only when you don't have uh, something like that going on. Yeah. yeah. Um, Erica, could I ask you, um, is there, when you're uh, setting up folks to, to participate in the, in the Monarch Community Science Project, do you ask them not to spray for mosquitoes, for example? We have a lot of backyard spraying that happens here in Wilmette. And do you have any way to kind of control that or how does that feed into this project? Well, so one of the uh, beauties and challenges of community science is, is you don't have control. Um, it's something that we talk about. Uh, typically, if you get your back air spray from mosquitoes, it, that's Promethean, um, which will definitely kill monarchs. Um, sometimes it, the sort of mosquito abatement stuff is often treating the storm drains, uh, which is not a problem for monarchs. Um, but yeah, we talk about that and, you know, it is, um, it can be a challenge to get pollinator plants that you know have not been treated with neonicotoids. Um, we encourage people, you know, it sounds like you guys have your own sale coming up. This is the season. This is why we do trainings in May uh, because you can still get um, milkweed. We will also do trainings in June because some people don't like think about doing it until they see a monarch, which is fair. Um, I should say, and I didn't say, this project is also bilingual. Um, the English trainings are up on our website. The trainings in Spanish will be posted in early May because we're onboarding a staff member to run those. Um, so, uh, so the, this is bilingual um, and we would love people to participate in Spanish. Um, that's been sort of rolling out slowly over time. But yeah, when people, that's why we grow our own plants um, is because when people are interested in June and the native plant sales are sometimes over um, and it can be really hard to get milkweed. So, right, and and the um, the issue of the, the spring um, is one that, that Go Green Wilmette has been paying a lot of attention to. And we've actually created, along with, as you said, the uh, mosquito abatement districts, um, they are very concerned about the backyard spraying uh, because it creates resistant, resistant insects. And so we, we along with um, the abatement district and some other groups have created a, 
information sheet to uh, pass out to people, which we will do at the farmer's market and any other time we can to try to uh, inform people a little bit better about, about this. And, and so, as you said, um, it does kill, kill the monarchs. So um, for, for some other q and I'm going to hand it over to Maria to pose questions for you guys. And so Maria, are you ready? I am ready. I am excited. Thank you, Catherine. All right. Um, okay, so just a quick clarifying question. We did have somebody wondering what instars are. If, if Erica, you could just touch on that really fast. Yeah, so that's the stages. I should have said stages. So the, they lay the egg and then the caterpillar, because uh, they don't have an internal skeleton, they have an external skeleton. So as it grows, it actually like sheds its, skele uh, its exoskeleton and grows. And so there's five of those stages and then it forms a chrysalis and becomes a butterfly and i should have said stages because that there's no reason to use instars <laughs> but that's the technical yeah. term okay wonderful um there was okay yeah so um we have a question from rhonda asking if it's better to plant milkweed and let the caterpillars and monarchs fend for themselves or to raise the caterpillars and in, in cages and release the monarchs and what ecological challenges that may present if they're hand reared. Yeah, so head starting or hand rearing, um, you know, so I would encourage people, there's a group called the Monarch Joint Venture, weird name, um, but that's sort of the consortium of all of the monarch people uh, in, the, in the US and they have a great website. They have a great kind of paper and statement on uh, head starting that, is generally what we agree with, which is it's super fun to do it like once with kids and we are trying to raise the next generation of scientists. So by all means, you know, do it, do it once with your kids, but in general doing it, especially the large scale productions that will do thousands upon thousands of caterpillars, those, those are a problem. Um, if you're, the Monarch Joint Venture has great instructions about how to do it. One thing is if you have like sort of a little mesh pop-up thing, actually doing it still outside but protected um, can be can be a way to kind of still have that experience. It seems like having the exposure to light can be really important, especially for that late season migratory generation. Um, and it's hard. I mean, we thought the reason people would quit the project is because we were asking them to monitor every week and that can be a lot. But a lot of people who quit, it's because it's hard for them to get attached to a caterpillar and you know, a week later it's gone. And yeah. You know, my, I say like, it, it was food for somebody, um, and, but that's hard because people get really attached and are frequently definitely looking more than once a week and just giving us the data from once a week, which is an awesome experience, but that can be hard, especially yeah. as I'm saying, like, do this with your kid. Um, also, because I don't study swallowtail butterflies, if you want to raise something, swallowtails are great. Uh, if you plant dill or fennel, like you, you, I can guarantee you, you will get swallowtails. I, I, I can't guarantee you monarchs, but I just feel like you will definitely get them. Um, and they, they're, there's lots of them. I have a swallowtail in my bedroom and I'm waiting for it to blossom. So hopefully soon. Yeah, it's been good fun. Yeah. Um, this question could probably go to either of you, Kate and Erica. Um, given the potential for a pollinator habitat in utility ROWs, do you have any advice for how a community can work with and or encourage ComEd to convert some or all of the ROW into native habitat? So I guess Kate from a Wilmette perspective and then Erica from a, a more general perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do believe that ComEd is actively doing work on this. Um, in terms of, you know, Wilmette hasn't partnered with ComEd to do anything like that yet, um, but it's definitely something that we would be interested in thinking about in the future. Yeah, from a national perspective, um, the rights of way have, they've done a legal thing, which is to sort of carve out an agreement with the Fish and Wildlife Service that if there is milkweed in the rights of way, it wouldn't be kind of considered a habitat you couldn't impact um, if monarch was an endangered species, which is a concern uh, if you're managing lots and lots of land. Um, and I always encourage people like, 
if monarchs were listed, that that doesn't mean that if you like mowed down milkweed in your yard, you would have created a felony. Um, as I said, the Endangered Species Act is very complicated. And while I don't speak for the Fish and Wildlife Service, that's definitely not what's going to happen. Um, they're going to be talking about large grasslands that would be protected in that way. Um, so to that end, like ComEd is, I know, actively like tracking where there is habitat um, and working on ways to sort of, you know, they can't have like trees growing under the power line. So they have to manage them, but manage them in a way that's smart and provides uh, as much habitat as they can. Yeah, thank you. That certainly makes sense. And I can see how there may be some challenges along the way. Um, Will is wondering what was going on in that graph, Erica, that you showed of the monarchs declining over the years. What was going on in 1996 and 1997 that there was so many, there was kind of a boom of monarchs? Yeah, so certainly, um, you know, it's not just milkweed uh, that controls the population um, that the idea that milkweed is, is very important is one that's well supported with science. Um, how much it's raining in Texas when they kind of make that, that first generation that's like overwintered and they have to get north and breed and lay eggs, how well that generation does is really important. And a lot of that can just be like, how many flowers are there in Northern Mexico and Texas? So like one year's weather can really impact the population. It can also impact it really negatively if there's like a frost in those OMIL trees, which usually doesn't happen, but when it does, like tens of thousands of butterflies die. Uh, Hurricane Harvey hit Texas right during migration and all conservation people were like, my butterflies. Also everyone I know in Texas, um, that's where I'm from. So individual things can, can matter. And that's why kind of maintaining that six or 15 acre number is important because you can have really good years and you can have really bad years. And that's why it's sort of not the best evolutionary strategy to take your whole population and congregate on the same trees in the forest. Um, but it looks really cool, so. I was actually born in Mexico and my family lived there for a while and were able to visit the monarch trees. Um, and I think an interesting question to that end is sometimes the US points its finger at Mexico and says, you're not doing enough. And then Mexico will point its finger at the US and say, you know, it's actually your fault. How can people who are interested in the welfare of monarchs who live in the US also get involved in maybe helping them out in Mexico too? Yeah, you know, I feel um, remiss that I didn't include more in my slides about that. Um, our colleagues at the Monarch Sanctuary in Mexico have done a huge amount. Um, we were really lucky that one of their um, one of the staff there presented at the, we used to have like an end of year party and eat pizza together in COVID. So we had a Zoom party um, and Eduardo, you know, really presented about the amount of work that's being done around the Monarch Sanctuary. It isn't to say that there aren't challenges there. They've had two of their Monarch Keepers murdered. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of challenges in conservation, but I've never been afraid that someone's going to murder me because I protect monarchs. So folks in, in Mexico are laying it on the dine and they're dealing with a lot of challenges. Um, we could do a whole talk about avocados and cartels and um, that would be its own thing. And, uh, but, but they're doing a lot and we're doing a lot. And there is a Back before certain elections happened, there was a trilateral agreement between Canada and Mexico and the US around monarch conservation. It was this awesome thing that kind of united the three countries on our continent. Um, so there's a lot of work being done. I mean, climate change is a huge part of this uh, and we can point the finger at everyone um, for that. So one thing about monarch conservation that I like is there's something real and concrete on the ground that we can do and I hope that doing that leads us to those big national and international actions um, that, and we need all of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for highlighting the work in Mexico. I think that people, yeah, the, the two murders, that was really hard to, to learn about yeah. last year, but I think that people don't realize how much work is also being done away from. Yeah. from the yeah. I guess I didn't say what people can do, but you know, knowing that work, there yeah. is, you can donate directly to the sanctuary. Um, if you're wanting to connect through a you know, U.S. nonprofit, the World Wildlife Fund works 
deeply in collaboration uh, with the Monarch Sanctuary. Um, so those, those would be the two direct connections I, I could make. And you know, it is important. Uh, the sanctuary does get money from tourism, which is not happening right now. Um, so they have lost that significant part, portion of funding that comes from people coming to visit the sanctuary. Yeah, it's a good point. It's, yeah. On a slightly lighter note, um, Kate, you had mentioned at, in one of your slides that um, there was no milkweed because it was a little bit shady. And so Tina had a question about what type of habitat milkweed requires. Um, and I'm going to join that with another question that was asking about some species of milkweed are maybe not as great as other species of milkweed. How do you plan what goes where and what can survive in what habitat? Generally, um, most milkweeds, it, it, they like sunny and dry. Um, I, I don't know, I, I would assume that the name milkweed came because they literally can pretty much grow anywhere though. Um, I mean, they really do grow, you know, on the side of highways and tiny little, you know, swaths of, of dirt. Um, so they're not super fussy, um, but just to, to get the, you know, the biggest bang up for our buck, um, we typically plant them in, in the drier, sunnier locations. Um, and in terms of different types of milkweed being more productive for the monarch, I, I don't think, I think Erica might be better to answer that question than me. Yeah, so uh, I always say that the best milkweed for monarchs is the one that you're willing to have and that will grow in your, in your space. Um, if you've got, a, you know, wet clay soil, um, rose milkweed or uh, swamp milkweed as it's sometimes called, both are the same, same plant, um, is gonna be happier there. That's also probably the one I'd start with growing in a pot. Um, you're gonna have to water a pot a lot anyway. So, uh, but it, it will, I have a, a sandy dry soil and it'll grow there. Um, it won't, common milkweed, is, true to the weed name will spread um, and it will take over whatever you've given it if it's happy. So I, it's a great one for between the garage and the alley, um, or if you're, it's sort of contained by a sidewalk. Um, or if, you know, if you're just happy mowing where it spreads, go for it. Um, but in terms of what, common milkweed is the powerhouse of our data in terms of monarch production. Um, it's also the one we have the most examples of. So some of that is sampling bias. We have four times as many examples of data collected from common milkweed. But it seems like across the literature that monarchs like common milkweed. Um, we have about the same number of data from swamp milkweed and butterfly milkweed, and we see more on swamp milkweed. Um, again, our data is small and new and messy, so certainly no one would publish it, um, just kind of telling you our experience. Uh, there's another one called world milkweed. These are the ones that we grow to give away. It's real small and fine and feathery and it looks like it would not support like a honking caterpillar and it totally will. Um, and it's really nice for kind of filling in. Um, we have it growing in a, that sort of example that Kate gave of the, I don't know, I call it the traffic bump out but it's really like about stormwater. Uh, we have it growing there um, and it kind of flops over into the sidewalk which can be a negative. Um, I'm, I'm gonna guess that the city didn't plant it and one of my neighbors just did. Um, we have a lot of options. Uh, there are um, just, I would Google a picture of like what you're planting and kind of think about it. Um, and then just try stuff, you know, they're plants. If they don't make it, you know, it's not the end of the world. Right. And I will say the, the orange uh, butterfly weed that I kind of highlighted, um, one of the reasons why I like to plant that is it is a little bit more compact, kind of like yeah. a shrubby, yeah. you know, um, uh, habit. Um, but it is harder to get established. Um, it definitely takes a couple of years for it to um, get to that, you know, shrubby type of um, habit. Um, so it takes a little bit more babying too. It takes a little bit more work. Yeah, we should admit that um, native plants, their first year don't always look their best. And Kate talked about that a little bit, but they sort of, first they sleep, then they creep, then they leap. This, I don't know, mnemonic wisdom that 
you typically you sometimes don't get a flower your first year. I have a butterfly milkweed that just it just doesn't flower every year. I mean, it it's sort of impacted by children. I mean, children are the children and dogs maybe are the the enemy of native plants. Um, yeah, we could not get our our butterfly weed established last year. Yeah. Um, Erica, you were talking about the emotional attachment people can can sometimes get to these monarchs um, or the caterpillars. My mother had a few last year and became very attached to them, and something killed them all. And so um, I think that sometimes if people see pests starting to get to to the to the caterpillars and hurt them, you know not to anthropomorphize everything, but um, you know, what, when do people want to get involved versus when do they want to kind of let nature do its thing? Like you said, caterpillars provide food for other organisms. Um, when, how should people toe that line between removing pests and, and kind of letting nature take its course? So uh, if you're doing our community science projects, one thing we let you do is you can sort of monitor the milkweed in your front yard and not your backyard or vice versa. You can kind of split it up because we know that people may want to collect caterpillars to head start, which you can't do from a patch for a project because that would totally screw up the data. <laughs> um, and so one thing can be to have a place that you, um, if you want to, to intervene where you're like, okay, I, I will do that here, but I'm not, I'm going to have a place that I'm not. Um, generally, if you're seeing sort of a bloom of pests, if you give it a couple of weeks, whatever eats those will increase in population and they will kind of check and balance each other. It, you know, we're not dealing with a completely wild ecosystem when we have our yard. So sometimes things do go awry. Um, you know, if you see something eating your milkweed, that's, that's good. That was the goal. Um, you know, if you, if your caterpillars are, you know, all dying at like, you know, after a week, um, just consistently week after week after week. Yeah. You know, maybe you, you want to observe and see what's happening, but it can be, um, you know, it was really dry last year. It was really dry. And we just saw less caterpillars um and it's hard to compare because we're and i should say also our data goes into a national database of people doing this kind of work the national monarch monarch, monarch level monitoring project which is good news for you because if like the field museum shut down tomorrow your data would is going to work where lots of scientists are going to analyze it we're most of the monitors in Chicago are doing our project, so we can't really compare it to others. Um, but generally, in places that experience the drought, we just saw less caterpillars. Yeah. Um, it's a bummer. Okay, that makes sense. That that's that's how the world works sometimes. Yeah. Um, Kate, Tom said. Tom asks if there's a fund in Wilmette that people can contribute to for this magnificent work. Well, thank you first for the compliment. Mm -hmm. um, we, we don't really have a fund. Um, we, we do have a bunch of uh, you know, different volunteer organizations in Wilmette that you may wanna reach out to if you wanna give some sort of monetary donation. Um, the Friends of Elmwood Dunes, for example, um, is, a, is a volunteer. Um, collective of, of residents uh, specifically related to the Elmwood Dunes site, um, which, as I mentioned, it's it started out completely covered with invasive garbage species, and we are still struggling with that today. Um, it's not like you plant it and all of a sudden the natives take over and it's the set it and forget it kind of thing. We are out there every single summer um, still controlling those invasive species. Um, so really, uh, you know, they, they will take a donation, but really we will also take your time too. Um, we're, we're looking for people who are interested in getting out there for, uh, you know, a, a day on the weekend and hand pulling weeds um, that, you know, wouldn't, uh, you know, some, some weeds react a little, some, some weeds, I should say, uh, respond better to um, a spot herbicide that we use. Um, and then some weeds really do need to be hand pulled and uh, that can be very time consuming. So um, if you're interested in volunteering, uh, you know, I think my contact information will be in the email that goes out at the end of this. 
reach out. Uh, we, we have a bank of, of volunteers that we uh, love to coordinate with um, for those, you know, weeding efforts and planting efforts too. Kate, is there a website that people can go to specifically to figure out when those volunteer days are? Um, no, we, we don't have a set schedule. Um, okay. It's very weather dependent and it's very uh, participant dependent as well. Um, but you can always just reach out to me. Sure. Awesome. All right. I think, I think we're coming up on time. So I'll turn it back over to Catherine. And uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Maria. That's wonderful. And uh, by the way, uh, Go Green Wilmot also has <laughs> work days every month throughout the summer at the uh, Gilson Park Bird Habitat, which is in uh, uh, Park District territory. Uh, and we welcome volunteers as, as well. So I certainly thank our panelists, just really wonderful discussion and wonderful uh, presentations. I hope that everyone has had a chance to think about where you live in a new and meaningful way. I just feel as if there were a lot of uh, ways to think in a new way about your yard. Uh, and so if you would like to find, learn more about the Monarch Community Science Project, we've got that in the chat, I believe, and that will also be in the follow-up email. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone to consider attending our upcoming webinars. You can find and register for the webinars at goinggreenmatters.org. You can also watch any webinars in the series that you have missed. The webinar recordings are available on Go Green Wilmette's YouTube channel. Finally, remember that our native plant sale will take place May 8th from 9 to 11 a.m. in Gilson Park. And I think that is all. Thank you again for attending. Bye-bye. Thank you for having us. Have a good day.